I often struggle is that how to bring emotional learning in this um, climate change work. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, how do I feel? How do I do it? I guess, uh, like, for me, it started when I went to university. You know, I grew up in two worlds, my the indigenous heritage and the European heritage. Like, my dad's indigenous and my mom was, we think, Austrian. We're not quite sure. <laughs> There's a story there. But I grew up like that with a foot in both worlds, and that's just kind of who I am. But most of the time, I focused on science and going through school, high school and college and university, focusing on the science part, which I enjoyed. I, I liked it. But when I got did my forestry degree, I just felt like there was a it wasn't what I expected. I remember we were talking about, you know, harvesting old growth forests. We were taught that, well, they're just dying now, so we have to we have to capture the economic value out of them as soon as we can because those old trees are dying. And to me, they were like, you know, precious old trees. Like, the, why would you want to cut them down just because they're not contributing to, you know, any more making any more wood on the tree? You got to, it just didn't make any sense. It didn't feel right. And then when I took ecology in uh, university, again, I didn't, it didn't feel right. I, it didn't, I think some things that they were teaching me just didn't make sense in my heart. And, so, you know, I struggled actually in, in ecology because I just couldn't understand it. Not not so much from an academic point of view, but from my heart, right? It didn't fit. Mm -hmm. So I remember those are the first kind of inklings. And then, um, then I went down a path of doing computer science stuff for about 10 years, um, really diving into, you know, very right brain analytical. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a very analytical side to me, but then I decided to do my master's in First Nation studies to uh, and learn about my heritage. And because my dad kind of, because he faced so much racism, he was, he really didn't want to talk about it that much. So I, at first he wasn't open to discussing because of all the racism he faced. So I kind of had to learn on my own and then he got used to the idea and then, then it kind of went from there. But so doing my master's in First Nation studies, I had to pick a thesis topic and uh, my uncle, Walter, he, who's from the Gitsan Nation. He's a master carver. And I, I was kind of hanging out with him because I do art, like I was learning art from him. And he was showing me this picture of a tree carving that was on his territory. And I thought, oh, wow, how come I never heard of these? I'm a forester. I'm an artist. I never heard of this art form where they carve faces on living trees. Like I heard of totem poles, of course, and stuff, but not these carvings of faces on living trees so I thought, well that'd be super cool thesis topics so i went to my made a wrote up a proposal and the university at first denied approval they said well these things don't exist so we don't want you to waste your time researching it well i go i saw a picture of one my uncle's territory and so i was kind of persistent there and it was kind of the first time where i realized that the western world didn't really see have eyes to see everything you know, these, I knew these things existed, but the university was saying they didn't. It was, and I was like, well, they do. So I did that, my thesis and I ended up writing a book called Faces in the Forest. That's probably when I was doing the elder interviews for that, I was asking the elders, have you seen these tree carvings? And, and then all they wanted to talk about was climate change and their worry about water. And, you know, I had a thesis to write and I was like, okay, so... But yeah, let's get back to these tree carvings. Oh no, we want to talk to you about water. And mm -hmm. so that was the first time I was like, wow, there's a big topic here too, but I don't have time to pursue it right now. So mm -hmm. I wrote a bit about it in my book, but then after I finished that book, I uh, decided I'm going to intellectually follow this path that the elders had laid out. So I started researching water on my own, like, you know, after work or whatever I was I always did this stuff independently because I realized the universities, if I work with them, they would kind of push me in a different direction. And I knew that I had to pursue this direction the elders are talking about. So I just had to do it on my own. That's why I call myself an independent scholar. I, I, I'm not funded by anybody. I'm not associated with any university. I, I needed the freedom to be able to pursue this. Otherwise, I get told not yes. to go down certain paths, right? And mm -hmm. especially the path of the heart. I really wanted to thank you for this book. First time I saw this, uh, not only you are articulating issues and problems, but also expressing oh, yeah. your emotion but in artistic form that I really appreciate because how are you going to communicate 
you know, the back to my first questions, unless we connect it to our emotion, the action doesn't follow. Yes. So, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I like to say that, like, um, there's a blue ecology water cycle diagram read in the kind of the last pages of the of the essay at the beginning of Oceanist book, and it has like the principles, spirit, mm -hmm. um, harmony, respect, unity, mm -hmm. and balance. Yeah. Those principles are core, and like balance, I like to say that both our heart and our brain have the same amount of water content, around mm -hmm. seventy percent. So, so that's where the balance is. Each of our, you know, we have to spend as much time in our heart as we do our brain, and our mm -hmm. body is set up that way to be nourished. We nourish our brain with just the same amount of water as we do our heart. And, uh, you know, academia, like you say, is is focused on the mind and is very good at that, but not balanced. And, right. and people feel embarrassed. Like I find, like when I, I'm a professional forester, when I talk to my own colleagues. Uh, I'll talk about emotions and spirit and they won't say anything in the group, but after I'm finished talking, yeah. come up to me and say, Oh, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to talk about the spirit, but I agree with you, but I just don't feel comfortable talking in a group about it. Cause I don't feel it's something that is something that they can share in public. So mm -hmm. I always find that interesting. Yeah. People come up to me afterwards and say, Oh yeah, I agree with you, but I just was a bit embarrassed to say that or whatever. Interesting that that people do want to connect, but then feel embarrassed that that's the judgment part. Yeah, like some of the learning principles in the indigenous world is learn by doing and learn by story. So, you know, ideally, like I'm starting this Blue Ecology Institute Foundation and it's going to be focused on youth and, and sharing Blue Ecology with youth and as a way to inspire hope because the youth that I'm talking to are they they've actually almost given up is the climate change is oh, reversible right. and, and they just feel hopeless in the future and you know that just makes me incredibly sad so the blue ecology is a source of hope but anyways like more the learning principles are learn by doing learn through story learn from your balance of heart and mind and spirit like you have to embrace all all of those and you know through that diagram of, of spirit harmony respect unity balance all those principles need to be at play in learning not just yes, including the moon and the moon exactly yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. tell me a little bit about like what's exactly a plan the blue ecology and then who who's been helping you what has been lord brock or who has been really facilitating alongside of with you Starting this foundation, there's basically, I was like a artist in residence at Echo Valley Ranch and Spa. Through that whole evolution of me being an artist there, the owner of, a, of the ranch is, is, I'm working with him, Flavia Fogiato, who's a, a lawyer, to start the foundation. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing all that work and it's like, I'm finding a lot of work to set up a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping, we're we're at the stage where we're going to focus test our website and mm -hmm. logos and ideas with with the uh, aboriginal youth and then hopefully mm -hmm. uh, have the website launched in the fall there's three of us that are working on uh, setting up this foundation up to that point it's been by myself it's been pretty lonely to be honest there's been quite a few hurdles and but also some very inspiring moments and i think one of the most inspiring moments that kept me going well there's two moments one uh, when I was inter interviewing an elder, uh, I write about it in one of my journal papers, Millie Michelle. Uh, it took me a long time to actually set up this interview because one, she didn't speak English and two, she didn't trust researchers. And then she sort of got to know me and trust me and that I wasn't like a, a university researcher. She was worried about that. She's had bad experience with them. So because I was independent, she agreed to, and I'm indigenous, she agreed to share her knowledge of water so i went to her house with an interpreter and uh when i got there her whole family like i mean 20 people were there in the living room with her to participate in my interview and and i do very ethical research so i had like ethical um you know permission like that she would sign and all that sort of stuff and went through all that so I usually do before I press record on my recorder. But when I got there, she just started. I didn't have time to ask her permission or anything. She just went for it. And the interpreter was listening and she spoke for 20 minutes solid, like just 
really fast in empty cabin language. I had no idea what she was saying when her yeah. we're in her living room with all her family and stuff. And then then she dropped to the floor and had a stroke right there in the living room. Oh. And she passed away about a half hour later in the in the hospital. Terrible emotional time. I felt super guilty. I was in the hospital with the family while she we were trying to figure out what happened to her. And I said, Oh, I'm so sorry. This was so must have been stressful for her and caused a stroke. And I felt horrible. And I didn't know what she was saying because I didn't understand the language. So there was all this flurry of emotions. And the the eldest son of the family came up to me and he said, Don't don't feel guilty. She she was actually supposed to pass away two days ago. And I go, what do you mean? She goes, he goes, well, her husband, her late husband came to her in a dream and called her to the other side, but she wouldn't go because she wanted to meet with me and share all of her concerns about climate change and water. And she saw me as somebody that was kind of carry the torch for her of, to do something. Right. So, um, that's what he told me. And I'm like, oh, wow. He goes, yeah, we're not, we're not mad at you. She was supposed to go two days ago. That's why we were all in the living room with her. That's why we all came wow. to her house for this interview. And I was like, holy smoke. So wow. anyway. I remember actually reading about that account. Um, I remember I found one of your documents about your collections with the um, interviews with elders. And I thought that was something that stuck out, stood out to me. But I'm really glad that you... Um, brought it up here. It's such a beautiful experience. I was wondering how you um, navigated these, especially like, you know, especially in, you know, a country like Canada, a lot of institutions are often explicitly colonial in nature. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how you navigated these kind of systems. Like you mentioned, you know, the university system, especially, I understand how Millie must be very distrustful of, you know, university researchers, especially because of the exploitation of indigenous people by anthropologists. You know, I have a background in anthropology and I understand that like, you know, anthropological systems oftentimes abused or exploited indigenous peoples for their own gain and oftentimes othered them. So I was wondering how did you personally navigate navigate a system that was not built for you and oftentimes exploited, um, you know, people who looked like you? Yeah, it's a very good question. I think one of the keys is not being in a rush or having deadlines where it takes time to build trust. And for I'm learning my own nation's culture. And when I'm talking to elders from other nations, it, they, it takes them time to be comfortable with me and my approach. And, you know, not being under a deadline really helps the that whole idea of time is different. I think in indigenous culture where there's no rush, it's first, you know, the first thing is to get to know each other and trust each other and know each other's family and, and just that builds trust. And then, and then the stories come and, and the, the wisdom of the elders, et cetera. And, and for them not to feel pressured, I think is, you know, by time or by me, and also that they know that I'm genuinely concerned about the climate change and water and those things, and yeah. and open to spirituality. Like <laughs> they'll they'll share more if they if they think you're non-judgmental, especially about the spiritual stuff. Again, it's back to that whole idea of the balance between the heart and the mind. That a lot of elders think that they're being judged by western culture for being emotional or spiritual and so yeah. they won't share it unless they see that you're open to it so i think some researchers miss out because they're just focused on the academic stuff whereas there's lots of good things about academia i don't mm -hmm. you know they're the rigor mm -hmm. research and there's all good training that it just it's too narrow you know if you're doing a master's or a phd you're rushed because you've got to you know, you got to get it done, right? But as an independent researcher, I've got, I'm not in a rush because I'm just trying to fit this in anyways and in my life and it's a year or two years or three years, it doesn't really matter to me. It's, it's hard to even have a conversation about what they don't know. You know, they feel the spirit, they feel their heart, but they just don't feel like they have permission to talk about it. And I think my role is to create an, a space or an environment for that people to feel safe about exploring. Um, mm -hmm. There definitely have been very frustrating moments for me where I've 
it's had a personal cost on my health and just to take some time to, to reset and re-energize for the next stage of my life. But mm-hmm. it takes, it takes a toll. Like I'm, definitely does as an independent it takes a toll, like especially, you know, those interactions where you're submitting, like writing a book or submitting a journal article and the editorial boards can be pretty harsh. Uh, yeah. The- to what extent that you pass on to your heritage to him yeah oh yeah like definitely like uh as a parent it's, you know it's it's tricky like you don't want to i did i did want to share with him both of my sons the indigenous experience so they've been to like feasts and they've and they've uh been to my blue ecology talks and traveled you know when i was working on the un with blue ecology they traveled with and they've they've been immersed in that side and and lately you know they were there on their own journey so when they're you know they're 23 and 26 so you know they're interested in trucks and trucks and girls and but now they're the older guy what he's doing he graduated from law he we really had some good conversations and i helped him on indigenous law and he's he wants to go into indigenous law now because he's really interested in it so so i'm really happy about that and, and and more so he's interested in environmental law that's even actually more important to me because you know that's we really need some people that have the mind and heart in the law area as well so I've shared when they want to learn and kind of took them to things when they were really young and also you know out in the bush teach them all the bush stuff and they grew up with it so which is good. Speaking of law, 2019, the Canada law that requires the government to consider the indigenous knowledge in the regulatory issues or some sort of a policy level, yeah. and how this this Western environmental assessment now has to really incorporate into indigenous knowledge. Do you see any changes on the ground level? Like one of the things that I've learned to try to separate is, or to to think about is what I call ceremonial reconciliation, which means, you know, on in National Indigenous Day, there's the companies and the mining companies and the forest companies have a, a ceremony and acknowledge the indigenous people, which is all great, but it doesn't change anything. Uh, you know, if you put up indigenous art in the lobby of your headquarters that doesn't really change the Mm -hmm. things that really matter to indigenous people so i differentiate ceremonial reconciliation with uh true reconciliation and Mm -hmm. and an example of true reconciliation for me is that western science would say we humble enough to for example acknowledge that water has a spirit it's not going to drastically undermine all of science it's gonna it's actually i think gonna improve it but It'll be a hard step for scientists to to make that. Uh, and the other one, you know, like we talk about the moon, like I'm suggesting that Western science should probably put the moon on the water cycle to have balance. Like uh, it's got the sun on there, but it's only sunny half the day. What happens to the water mm-hmm. the rest of the, in the nighttime? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So that takes humility and, and that's where true reconciliation will happen is when Western world is actually humble enough to make changes to their system based on what they to improve it based on suggestions and knowledge from the indigenous world we're not there yet we definitely yeah. are not there yet like the some of the you know taking into mm-hmm. account indigenous input on building a new mine or doing an environmental mm-hmm. assessment it's almost still ceremonial they talk yeah. to them but they don't make any changes mm-hmm. That's the shift that we need to do is move from ceremonial to actual true reconciliation. Mm-hmm. So we're, that's not happening yet, unfortunately. We really have to gear towards the educating the youth. Yeah. Practice philosophies and indigenous knowledge. It's like a have to be liberal arts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. no, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. And I think like in the, the indigenous perspective, like I, I see you as youth. Like our broad definition of youth is quite more broader than the Western. Okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. like uh, like under 40, it's kind of youth. I have daughters, but yeah, but I see the younger generations, they, they feel quite anxious about the climate change and they feel, they are. unfortunately. They're they're hurting, like they're, yeah. they, they're really grieving their future. Yeah. They feel like they've lost their future and that's super sad. And I think we have to let them, like the first step for me is like, acknowledging that through a ceremony that 
yeah you are grieving because you feel like you're losing your future what a horrible thing and mm -hmm. and uh, but there is hope and then but we have to be able to let them go through that mm -hmm. period of, of expressing their grief and then regaining hope and that's what this blue ecology foundation is going to focus on you probably feel like everything's on your shoulder to like a yeah. coach but at the same time, I'm thinking how I can personally and also organizationally make connections to what you and the indigenous communities are doing so that uh, we're doing it together. Yeah, that's a very good point. And it's like, I think I've been so used to doing it on my own. It's taken me a while to open up to ask for help and, um, and also be helpful to others. See myself as part of this a node in the network of people that are concerned about this and and to feel like uh, we're not alone and like i'm sure you guys feel that way too or you're yes. you're feeling alone and that's that's a tough slog sometimes but mm -hmm. you're right it is good to have allies and and colleagues that you feel like that are you can talk to about it number one and you know have the, out of the emotional level and the intellectual level and also you know just to share resources i think it's mm -hmm. I think it's very important like because there's just yeah yeah your book is on the on the shelves for the november i'm looking forward to to tapping into this uh, youth around here that are wanting to do something yeah. but are lacking the opportunity to hear directly and yes. discuss uh, the fear of being judged or, or expressed uh, fearlessly that like, like you are doing with this book yeah i'm really looking forward to it mm -hmm. yeah i'm open to all kinds of idea yeah, thank cool. you. yeah thank you for everything that you do i you know i think my speaking from the heart i really feel a genuine connection with you guys and and i feel you know safe safe sharing the more emotional spiritual stuff i can so i i appreciate that as well and and I'm also interested in, you know, I don't know everything about water and I'm always keen to learn more. You know, that story you told about the, you know, the, the crying is a very poignant story. I like to hear stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, I'm a student as much as a teacher. So wow. any information you have, I, I appreciate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, 